Hello and welcome to a new edition of Crypto Career Podcast. We've done a number of podcasts in the recent weeks about staking and restaking. And for today, we are changing the theme and talking about another very trending uh, narrative. I am really happy to have Ahmad Shadid, the founder of Ionet. Hi, Ahmad. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm great. Thank you very much for having me over here. Very excited. Amazing. Thanks. So we are. Uh, we know that AI um, plus crypto is uh, one of the hottest trends uh, right now in crypto. Uh, even Vitalik and uh, the co-founder of Ethereum, has uh, talked about it and continues to talk about it and even write articles about uh, the intersection of blockchain and AI, which I think uh, many agree is uh, are two of the technologies that are the most transformative in our decade and maybe even this century. Um, the potential that they have so really happy to have uh, discussions around this um, topic um, with you but to start uh, we always like to start with the you know uh, person we are interviewing can you tell us about your background how you came to crypto and what led you to start um, Ionet I saw on the internet that you started uh, in 2018 with a fund that were doing active trading so maybe you can mention about uh, you know uh, uh, your journey so far yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think, I, I, by the way, like I started my love to crypto back in, you remember when was Ethereum uh, just like being launched? That was uh, 15, really 2016, 16. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, 2016. Uh, I, I remember before that I bought Bitcoin from an ATM machine and I lost the, car, the paper. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but then after that, uh, everyone was like, you're crazy, what are you doing? Um, it was like 500 euro at that time when I bought it. And, and then I, I got in Ethereum and Lisk, if you remember Lisk also. Yes, yes. And Lisk, yeah, that was at that time, like Lisk, then EOS, then like all these players at that time. Um, yeah, I started my YouTube channel too, was very active, uh, became a call myself in the Middle East, the largest influencer in crypto for a very long time. Uh, then I stopped, uh, I started... I started a community-based uh, fund from the, uh, like a syndicate, let's say, in a way, from the from the followers and so on, and from uh, like other uh, like connections, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, try to go through the journey of someone who never actually managed the fund to you know figure it out. Like, um, yes, I was trading normal like anyone else. Um, back in 2016, 2015, I was, I, I was already trading since 2014, other things, but like in 2016, I really took trading seriously in a way. Um, and I, I wanted to, you know, um, just learn more about fund management, learn about crypto specifically, but toward fund management. Um, grew up in that direction, uh, went to Hong Kong at that time of 2018, Hong Kong token 2049. Yeah. For me, that was like the spark of crypto. Uh, this is like my spark, I guess I, I consider it. Um, from there, like I really like went full throttle in cryptocurrency. I'm like, literally there's no nothing else but crypto in my attention. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, I remember, yeah, I, I remained in Hong Kong uh, to like kind of understand the, the fun scene there, how it's going on, how they're raising money, how they're not, uh, you know, how. How, they, how, how much they're earning, how they're earning, how they're choosing stocks, uh, sorry, crypto, what was their strategies, right? Uh, is it similar like traditional markets or they have like something unique? I tried, it was really hard to make money uh, from trading uh, and I reached to the conclusion as of, uh, and trust me, I learned so many things to a point where you maybe wouldn't believe, but I like, like I, I became like a global advisor on, on order flow surface trading, uh, on volume based profile trading, on like anything volume trading, and still something that doesn't work. I see. Uh, so, I saw. A, I saw a video from you, uh, which is available on YouTube, where you're talking about whales and the market manipulation back from 2018, I think. Yeah. So then, then the story reached to point where like it's not about what you know as of knowledge in executing trades. It's about what you know before you executed the trade. Basically, the, the information you have, whether it's an insider information that you bought from a WeChat group or something else. 
So that what what I found out is like there's these WeChat groups with big uh, cryptocurrency founders uh, from China and and Hong Kong and so on in these groups. You know, they're just discussing normal things, right? It's a closed group between executives. But the lawyer in the group, the lawyer literally in the group, is selling the information of what's happening to people outside for like $20,000 for listing news or this or that and so on. So that, I was exposed to that market. Like I reached to a point where I actually understood that's how most of funds are actually making money. And it's like, wait a second. So everyone's just either have insider information or bought an insider information. So at the end, like they buy insider information or there's some, they're just lucky. Uh, they know the founder, they know this, they know that. There is something, you know, especially because it's un, very un, you know, unregulated scene. So I was like, I either buy inside the information or I have to uh, find another way, which is let's, think, let's reverse engineer the psychology and what actually happens when someone buys an inside the information. Um, and I reverse engineered that into coding. I'm an engineer. And I was like, okay, wait a second. So... There's multiple people. Someone who buys inside information for 20K and buys with his account literally from Binance and just market order. I don't want that guy. There's another guy who buys and, uh, you know, also through his phone or through his laptop, he puts a few limit orders. Not that guy. I want the guy who gets the inside information and then uses advanced order execution systems to fill the order in the market. Only. Because this guy, he, if he has enough money to build this order execution management system, uh, which basically it's a system that fill order in the market, small tranches by hiding it, like these bots, right? They, they yeah, so we're about. talking about advanced TWAPs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They are based on VWAPs, TWAPs, and so on. If, if there is, if, if a fund manager or whoever bought this inside information is filling order using this system, it's definitely worth it. Yeah, it is something like, he, first of all, he's worth it because he has the money to build the system. Um, and he's hiding orders at like for a longer time, a huge quantity. I was like, okay, no, this is, this is a guy I want to catch and I want to follow, but I don't want to know why he's buying. I don't care. I just want to buy. So I reverse engineered that algorithm. I called it dark tick. Uh, and uh, actually it was called Black Whale in a way, but then we changed it to Dark Tick because Dark Tick is more sophisticated to this because it's actually, it capture each tick data, it, mm -hmm. it advanced more. It was like a simple one at the beginning. Now I had like some kind of um, trading view alternative uh, SaaS platform. Indicator, yeah. Uh, then moved to, yeah, then moved to uh, you know, having Antbit and uh, W Borsa Antbit, uh, which is this quant trading. Um, so yeah, it was called dark tick. Like I was always holding this like dark tick with me in a way. Um, and even even to this point, I have a company called dark tick. It's it's something like it's something separate. Dark tick is something closed. So this algorithm, it's like my my invention through like six years of work so far. It's just evolving. Um, now it evolved to become a really advanced risk management system that monitors like multiple markets just to detect crashes. Like that's. Mm -hmm. One of its main main jobs is to de detect this ma this sudden crash of Bitcoin, right? Yeah, so we can to think about it thousand. like a quant trading uh, like firm. You are trying to quantitatively quantitatively um, find patterns. Now let's talk about Ionet. How that this you know experience in trading yes. led to you to Ionet? Perfect, and that's that's like I wanted to build the base. So the base is here, like this grow to this dark tick, and yes, probably it was long uh, intro on this, but dark tick, this algorithm, you know, I wanted to catch whales, but I needed to ingest more data. So this system has to like read a lot, read a lot, read a lot, and, and ingest a lot of data, and then store it, and then analyze it. Uh, and then it, it was like a tree-based system where it's like kind of simple logic, but then it evolved to become a machine learning model for each uh, asset I want to monitor. So imagine each coin on each pair, like USD, uh, like you know BTC USDC, BTC USDT, BTC. Each one of them, I have to monitor it separately, and I have to have an ML model for each one of them separately, separately. So I have uh, I had 150 uh, on cryptocurrency. I was monitoring 150 different pairs, uh, plus a thousand stock. So that by itself. So I have to each one of them requires a GPU at least, just if I wanna if the model is ready. Yeah. But we are you know fine to 
mm -hmm. training, it parallelized training brings back to, the amount of GPUs. I need more than a thousand GPU, like 1,400, 1,700, sometimes 700, depends on the market volume and the liquidity and so on. Depends on the speed that the data is coming in. I will have to scale up this GPUs or scale down the GPUs. So that was the infrastructure, like the back end infrastructure of the system uh, of this quant fund. And basically also it has to fill orders for hundreds of accounts on the same 100 millisecond latency without delay. Now, because that high end requirement, like 100 millisecond latency, it's, it's very low latency, by the way. It's not as low as like, you know, 50 millisecond or whatever, but still it's, it's 100 millisecond latency for a GPU and model inference and all that. Like it's, it's, it's very high, high requirement. And it's like the highest bar, kind of the highest bar possible. So when I built the architecture and all the system, I was building it for, you know, 100 millisecond latency and something that is as scalable as for like for thousands of GPUs. Um, and what, what actually happened is in 2022, we all know the market was really bad. So I wanted to kind of reduce my expenses. Um, we, we made like minus 7% in 2022. So it's a good number, by the way, compared to the other funds who are like minus 40, minus 60, minus 20. Like we, it was it really, was I'm very proud COVID of this year. Number. Yeah. Yeah. Because 2021, we made 1,300%. Mm -hmm. right? So minus 7% on 2022 is, is, is amazing. Uh, we detected actually the Bitcoin crash in, uh, in 4th of December 2021. So like this system is really crazy. And, but it, it eats a lot of compute power. It's, it's really, you know, compute power hungry, GPU hungry. Now, what happened is in 2022, I have to reduce the expenses because, you know, I, I don't charge any uh, management fee. I only charge performance fees. So now there's no performance. I need to reduce. I either pay from my pocket or just like kind of balance up the uh, expenses for uh, for running the infrastructure and servers and so on. And we were using AWS. Each one of the cards was causing me around like $26, $29 a day, wow. which is very hard. It's, it's a high number. And imagine paying that every like every day, every day for 1,000 to 500 cards. At least my bill was between 140 to 240, sometimes $90,000, but sometimes $150,000, $250,000. Depends on the, again, like how many GPUs I use, depends on the volume. And this is really hectic bill. Yes, in 2022, we were like, you know, hyped with the market, green, a lot of profits. It was really easy to, to you know, to cover this expense. But now in 2020, when, when we moved sort of to 2022, after the Bitcoin crash and the beer market when it started, Yes, we had to reduce expenses, considering that this beer market could extend to 2023. Like that was already in the planning. Um, so, okay, what to do? I called my friend in uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Kuwait. They have uh, ether mining farms, and now you know this. At that time, ether is moving to proof of stake, and uh, you know things are not stable, and no one is happy with the profits. I'm like, how much are you making for your RTX 3090? He said uh, around like 75 cents a day. 76 cents on that. Look, I'm going to give you $3 a day. Just give it to me. Mm -hmm. this, this, I'm paying $26 for this card, you know? Uh, so just, I wish I could take this card for $3. I don't know how it came to my mind. It was like, it's just like obvious. Like we have these guys with the mining farms. Let's figure out a way to use them. But then, you know, you have all these problems and troubles with the way they run their mining. They are, they are on flash drive, this, that. There's so many things that have to be fixed and changed to fit ML use case and also fit ML use case for 100 millisecond requirement. Yeah. Right? Remember mm -hmm. that still. Um, so that took me like a few months of work and configuring the uh, clustering technology we were using so we could use GPUs because we scaled. I used my friend GPUs in, uh, in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, but also it's not enough. Like you have only like 400 GPUs. I need 1,500 GPUs. So I need to use GPUs from another location too. So I have friends in Slovenia. I used to live in Slovenia. I have friends in Slovenia. Like, hi guys, come <laughs> on. These guys introduced me to the human. So I'm back in 2016. So like, I need I need your GPUs. And then they have friends in Iceland and Norway. I need your Z GPUs and so on. So I was using their GPUs. I connected to multiple like mining facilities and mining farms for the sake of using GPUs for my own infrastructure. And I knew that in 2024 uh, or 2023, end of 2023, like things could be better or 2024. So I have to be ready just to know where I'm going to bring supply when we ha will have more volume and we need more GPUs for, for the quant fund. 
So that's where I built my network, let's say. Um, and then in 2023, like after almost a year of doing that for myself, I don't know, it just hits, right? Like, wait a second, did I just build a deep end? You know, like it just hits. Mm -hmm. That's, I don't ask me that's that. very interesting like because hits, like, uh, there okay. are a number of uh, very successful startups where the initial idea was to build another startup. I think, for example, maybe Spotify, if I'm correct, was something like that, where they didn't want to build a music st streaming thing subscription. But, you know, through working on that initial idea, you realize, oh, wait a second, there is a much bigger problem actually somewhere else that I'm, you know, that I'm affected by. And therefore, I can actually maybe solve that bigger problem. So it seems that through your trading, you know, journey, you landed on the perfect narrative, which is deep in and AI. Let's talk about that. Um, sure. So um, we, there are mentions about, you know, GPU being the new like oxygen or blood or oil or whatever and we know that there is a shortage of gpu which uh, by the way isn't really new but to is maybe new to new people that weren't exposed to ml because already the pace of adoption in machine learning and in um, data science was such that um, we needed more gpus and uh, you know there is also these gpus are also used for gaming and for rendering and for many other things and so there is a real um, problem with you know creating these chips um, and you know we lack really um, there is a problem here and so now with these big LLM uh, models language large language models this is even bigger because now there is just a new um, set of users and businesses and startups that want to build on top of that and this is really very heavy and so I'm um, you know the Bitcoin halving is approaching I'm thinking about that problem in a similar fashion where Bitcoin halving is approaching, so this means that, you know, half less selling pressure. On the other side, you have these ETFs that are creating huge amount of demand. So both demand is increasing a lot and also supply is decreasing. So this is a supply shock. And I see a similar pattern in uh, GPU where we can't produce too much more, too many more GPUs. That's a problem. There's a hardware, you know, restriction here. Uh, and on the other side, because of all this AI hype, there is much more demand compared to before. And so there is a real shortage problem, right? Yeah, that's fair. Uh, that's fair saying, of course, the, I think that there's multiple factors that, that, that's putting this problem, right? I, yes, when we run all, like any model that you, any AI thing that whatever you see, whether it's an app or it's a feature or whatever, it has to use GPU, feed. Period. It's like there's no no way around it, and uh, you know these GPUs, as you know, we used we used to use them for crypto mining, gaming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and they're just so good with uh, you know kind of like transformers, uh, which are basically the architecture behind uh, some of the models that we're uh, playing with right now. Um, and large language models, yes, they are using a lot of GPUs, uh, and they need sometimes multiple GPUs for one model to run just to run because it's a big model. Um, and they use like thousands of GPUs when you train them. Uh, actually, uh, by end of 2024, uh, Facebook would have 800,000 H100 GPUs. So they would be like the largest in the world who have this. Yeah, Mark, he spoke about it. He launched, posted the video on Twitter. Um, Twitter, I think Facebook. <laughs> I don't know when I saw the video. Maybe Twitter, actually. No, I think Twitter. No, actually, I saw it in, in Twitter. Um, yeah, so so there is like more and more uh, demand on the GPUs, and the I don't know where to start or what we really care about to know like where where's the thing we should be talking more about that's really critical. But what what is really really important is that this GPU is is becoming more like um, a currency by a government uh, to control um, uh, sanctions to. to to control, even to, it's being used right now to sanction countries. Like when Saudi Arabia, um, you know, had better relationships with China um, and they invited him to Riyadh and so on. Literally, US uh, put Saudi Arabia in D5 sanctioned countries or D5 great sanctioned countries. So meaning that they are sanctioned from, uh, they, they have this, um, export embargoes, like they're not allowed to export control. There's some export control that you're not allowed mm -hmm. to ship GPU to Saudi Arabia 
that A100 or H100. And if you actually do that, it's a provocation of the Patriot wow. Act. Like imagine, like it's, it's, it's really, it's serious, so serious. Just because, you know, so it's being used politically. Okay. This is how important it is. And because of the GPU problem, like, it's, uh, and honestly, US is pushing China on this GPU. They don't want them to access the GPUs. This caused more tension for China. They want to take over Taiwan because Taiwan has that chip factory, TSMC, that is making these chips. The only one in the world that can make it. Uh, now, of course, if they come in, the U.S. said, if you take over China, uh, Taiwan, we will bomb TSMC. They literally said that. So, like, uh, so it's like what could actually even prevent China from taking the uh, Taiwan is because if they took it, that factor will be bombed. And if that factor is bombed, it's a huge tr problem for, for NVIDIA. Time. First first um, of all, for NVIDIA, and, right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, for, for NVIDIA, even yeah, for Apple, Apple yeah. like everyone. Because, because uh, uh, they are the main manufacturer, like these companies, like they bring in the chip design and then in TSMC, they, uh, they, they manufacture these chips. Now, that costs like, you know, I don't know, hundreds of billions to build again, considering the knowledge, the experience, the team to bring in, the supply chain, it's, it's very complex. That's why we heard Sam Altman saying he want to raise $7 trillion to fix the chip problem, right? Now, yes, we could laugh at it, we could see it seriously, but it is a big problem. It's, it's that big. It's like $7 trillion big problem. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a really serious problem. So the problem... Um, mm -hmm. and Go on. Yeah, what I wanted to say is, considering that, you know, looking at this problem, this actually makes it a very great opportunity. Like, even if there's 10 IO Cloud clones in the market, there's totally no problem. Like, it's, it doesn't really matter. There is so much, like, demand on GPUs that bring in as, as many GPUs as you need. At the end, it's, of course, definitely the custom Absolutely. service, the, the, the features and so forth. But let's say we have literally same ex customer experience journey uh, as I mean customer experience, same quality of control, same quality of, of, of cluster, same features, everything exactly the same. Put hundred IO cloud, there is I think maybe okay, hundred would be enough, but like there is really a room yes. for a lot. The market so is so big. Play. And I'm talking about yeah, the market now. It's not yet the market that's gonna come in the like one and a half year or two years. We're just talking about now. Absolutely. So the problem you're addressing is the shortage in GPU. There are a, a number of very established players like Microsoft and uh, you know Amazon and Google cloud services that are the big providers, right? Uh, right. Like any Web two company who is in tech, they are using this. But your solution is to say, okay, we're gonna aggregate consumer GPUs, which are spread across the world. You know, maybe. You know, some people have a form of GPU, some other people like myself, I have just a powerful laptop that is underutilized and you're using all these resources, creating a cluster and on top of that, providing a software techno technology that allows, you know, to um, these, um, these entities and these networks to interconnect and to provide uh, people with the ability to train and inference uh, their models. Now, there are already a number of, you know, GPU cloud services in Web2. You mentioned that the market is so big that uh, there, there is place for many competitors. But I want to hear, like there are, for example, Lambda and RunPod and Corviv, all these Web2. Not specifically talking about Ionet, but what would you see as an advantage of creating a Web3 alternative for this, you know, GPU cloud? Okay, so let me like kind of put a few things in context. Uh, yes, we are competing with CoreWave, Lambda Labs, or Lambda Cloud, uh, AWS, and Google Cloud. First, first step. Second is uh, we are not only targeting consumer GPUs. We are uh, like we are opening all types of GPUs to join the network, whether it's consumer or enterprise grade GPUs. As of Ionet team and uh, all the sales team we have and all the support, we are focused on bringing in crypto mining facilities and data centers. That is who we are like sourcing most of the GPU supply from. It's actually more than 80% of our GPU supply that coming from either a crypto mining facility that have hundreds of GPUs or a data center that no one knows about and they just bought some GPU supply 
and they want to resell it. Like this is mainly okay. our GPU supply. And we are playing around with, with consumer GPUs as of like a, it's a playground sandbox environment where we are trying to like make it appealing for the ML engineers uh, to to test out these devices and, and see how they could fit within their um, apps and how they could reduce their inference cost and so on. But we still have so much supply coming in from the data centers and mining facilities that is unutilized, which also, by the way, this supplies like really high security standards, SOC 2 compliance reporting, et cetera, et cetera. So there's still a lot of this supply that's still underutilized and that we have not fully utilized for us to say like we have extra, we want to access the excess capacity on the consumer end. Right? Now, but this is, by the way, a global problem. Now, next is uh, talking about like Core Wave or Lambda Lab and AWS and so on. Um, it doesn't really matter if we are cloud, if we are Web3 or Web2. I never said Web3. And honestly, I really don't care. What I care is one thing. I bring in GPUs to the market. That's what I want. That's that's what I'm here for. I'm here to solve the problem of of ML engineers and AI large scale AI startups unable to find 100 GPU right now. I, I am having this challenge with everyone. Go rent 100 GPUs in a one click anywhere, anywhere on the whole planet. You can't find it. It's serious. And this is a challenge to your viewer. If someone managed to win it, I'm giving him 10,000 IO coins <laughs> in one hour. If he really in one hour could prove he can rent 100 GPU from somewhere he didn't open an account before. Permissionless and stuff. Mm -hmm. of course. But, you know, look, no, even if it's decentralized, centralized, I don't care. Just anywhere in the world. Like, just one, like, get me 100 GPU in one hour. I can't, you can't. So, that's how big the problem is. So, and I don't really care if it's Web3, Web2. I don't care. I just want GPUs to be served for a scale AI startup. However, I am, whatever I, how I want it to look like, doesn't matter. We need to serve, we need to solve the problem, mainly. That's what we're here for. We're here to solve the problem of the GPU shortage, first. Then second is, while we're solving that problem, we're going to have, you know, millions of dollars flowing in from each client every month to buy the compute power. If we have a, a cryptocurrency there that is IO coin behind it, then you can build really a, a a coin that is bringing bridging Web two money to Web three. Whenever this coin is bought through for the compute power, it's burned, right? And it keeps flowing. So imagine it's like millions of dollars flowing every day just to burn the coin. That would be something unique, and that's why we have a coin, right? And also you need the coin because you can't pay uh, the GPU suppliers that are coming from Kazakhstan, this that's multiple countries that are maybe not sanctioned. But it's so hard to send money to through bank and wire transfers and so on. And he, here with crypto, every minute, like if you're a worker and you are hired, each minute you're going to be like, you know, emitted, small emission, because you're earning, like you are claiming you're earning immediately. Every minute is sent directly to your wallet. So that is not doable without like a very fast blockchain, very cheap, uh, zero, like almost zero fees, and uh, without actually having a cryptocurrency to do that. Like to, to facilitate all these tra transactions. Across Absolutely. I think there are a number of advantages that you mentioned that are really um, like the core values of DeFi, you know, this incentivization through um, tokens, etc., which can really solve problems here, both for payments and uh, fast payments, easy payments, uh, universally accessible, uh, which can allow actually Web3 alternatives, uh, IONET including, to compete and even be better solutions compared to the Web2, you know, GPU platform for providers. Now, you mentioned a number of different sources, so like different data centers and crypto minings, etc. cetera. Uh, what do you think at a large scale, because you have very ambitious plans about number of GPUs you would like to acquire in the next years, what do you think as a, is it the most scalable source of GPU that you could get uh, in the long run to compete with the big guys? I, I think you mean for, yes, from like which source? I think two two critical yeah, two critical things. I believe the M three M three M one M two clusters, you know the silicon chips clusters. There's no one in the world actually can give you a cluster of M one M two whatever any chip cluster. 
uh, and the M3 Ultra and the M2 Ultra chip is actually almost as powerful as the A100, that's $14,000. So that's how good the M chip is. Like the memory, it has like 112 or 108 gigabytes of memory, and the A100, A100 has 80 gigabytes of memory. And that's the, this is the M1 Ultra chip. So these chips, I think, were, if, if the owner of that chip like have one terabyte or 500 gigabyte of free storage, and one plus one gigabyte of internet connectivity, which is easy to make, honestly. It's right now there's fiber optics, anywhere in the world you can find one gigabyte connectivity speed. If you have one gigabyte connectivity speed, uh, you know, one terabyte or 500 gigabyte of storage and these M chips, right? That's it, that's like, and, and think how many, like 23 million M chip was sold in the last uh, year, in 2023. 21 or 23 million chip. So, meaning that like it's so easy to get a million GPU, right? But not only you get a million GPU, you get a million M3 chips with hundred gig with a gigabyte connectivity speed, very fast and so on. So I think that we like we suddenly again we didn't want to do the M chip, right? We started the RTX cards and, and we I want to do the AMD support and then suddenly the M chips comes to the line and we're like, wait a second. Actually, with M chip is even more network effect. It's you can even faster boom the network and have more supply like in the in the speed of light because you basically have these chips everywhere. But yes, there is some problem that they have to have better internet speed. They have to have more storage, and it has to be dedicated. You know, it has it can't be like it's my laptop. I want to play with it whenever I want. No, it's you buy it, you leave it, you don't touch it. Like that's how it should, it's supposed to be. Um, which is easier to buy now than the RTX cards, right? The 4090 and all. They're so expensive. They are like 100% more expensive than their price in the US. So in US, they have a price. Everywhere else, it's like 100% more expensive. Um, so that's from the consumer side. From the uh, data center, the enterprise grade side, I see that IO itself is going to be uh, financing and building its own data centers and facilities. And we want to, we want to, like our goal is to always have to own 20% of the GPUs okay. we have in our mm -hmm. network at all times. So as if there's M chips, we want to have 20% of the available M chips for us. If there is RTX chips, we want to have 20% of the RTX chips. And we are buying, we're like buying, every day we're buying new, new So um, IONET has a pretty complex economy with multiple stakeholders. You have um, the you know, GPU providers uh, or workers, I think you call them, you have uh, users of, you know, models and you have, you know, the machine learning engineers or uh, AI startups who wants to use this uh, infrastructure. Uh, in terms of users of the GPUs, um, who are your target audience? Like, are you targeting like big um, tech firms, AI startups, like startups like Uber and Spotify who have huge data science, you know, uh, things that are currently using like Microsoft Azure and AWS. What are you, who are you targeting? Beautiful question. I'm going to first answer you the short one. We are targeting anyone that has, as a company, $5 million in their bank account up to 50 million. Like this within, while you are within this range as a startup and you have a plus 100,000 user, you are our target audience, like from 5 million to 50 million and you have more than 100,000 users on whatever app you have built. Meaning that we don't want you from scratch. We want you already have reached a point where you have 100,000 users, you're scaling fast, you need more GPUs, there's not enough GPUs. Uh, you have also cash to pay for the GPUs you need. This is the target audience to build the platform. Like we really like focused on this uh, audience. Now, the long answer of this is why we're focused on this audience. Because uh, you know, you have, there's so much products on the lower level, like anyone who's had like below 5 million. And there's the big players basically for anyone who have above 50 million, right? You have AWS, Google Cloud and so on. Ionet want to reach at that point. Ionet want to reach to be the AWS in the cryptocurrency market. Now, <clears throat> not for the cryptocurrency market, in the cryptocurrency market, because we're not for cryptocurrency market is so small. So you aim we to compete with the big guys in the long term, like for you to compete with AWS? Of course. Our, our, our competitor is actually Google Cloud, AWS, and Lambda Cloud. Like we are either losing clients from them or we are taking clients from mm -hmm. them. It's like, that's how it's going. 
So now, now um, why? Because the small guys, you know, you have so many platforms like RunPod, uh, if you heard about it, uh, you have, what else? Like any, any actually like small deployer model that you are really, like really simple stuff that serves more like um, indie developers, I would call them, like games, like indie game developers. So like indie developers mm-hmm. who are like working at home, text testing, experimenting, mm-hmm. researching at university, small, like playing some room class, whatever, like his uh, homework. So that's not our audience. Like they are welcome to use the platform, but we don't hunt them. Like we don't go out to bring them uh, because these guys, they don't rent clusters. And our service is to these clusters. You don't reach to a point where you need clusters before you are already training a heavy ML model, before you are already actually in a company with a team who have a lot of money and want to scale the model because they, are, they also have a lot of users. Then you start thinking of this uh, clusters that are multi-nodes, right? Like you, and, and when we say clusters, also, by the way, this word is a little bit confusing in the industry. Some people say cluster for a mm-hmm. machine of eight GPUs. They call it a cluster. Some people call uh, three machines connected literally together or like few machines connected together with infinite band cable. They call it a cluster also. Uh, and some uh, call cluster uh, as uh, like cluster, like the cluster of like basically, I don't know, 100 GPU in AWS, 500 GPUs in Google Cloud, I know, a thousand GPU and Lambda Cloud. These are my clusters. See, these are three clusters. One is like 50 GPU, one is 100 GPU, one is like 300 GPU. And all these are not single machine. They are like multiple machines together connected with the same network. And then, then you have the problem of like, okay, now I have this 500 GPUs. Okay, what's next? Like, how can I actually parallelize the work across these 500 GPUs? Here, if you don't know, meaning that, you know, it's, you are not, you're still small as of, uh, as of a company, meaning that you still need to hire MLOps, DB, DevOps, et cetera, these guys to help you scale this infrastructure, to help you use the right package and libraries to control these machines and make sure they work properly, monitor them, et cetera, et cetera. And then even you need to change the code base itself in a way to fit sending jobs to multiple machines, which takes like six months to prepare. So we are after that point, like, once you are already in that trouble and already knows that you need clusters and already know, and because you don't really feel the GPU shortage problem before you cross this point, you don't feel it. Like you can right now go rent two GPUs, you'll find it, 20 GPUs, you'll find it, 36 GPUs, maybe you find it. Mm-hmm. You can find it, it's like one machine with 30 GPU, whatever, but you can never, not never, but I mean, as of my knowledge, which is very limited, but as of like 300 data centers I know in the, in the list, no, you cannot find 100 GPU. You can find 30, 20, maybe 60 if you're lucky, but 100 is almost impossible. Now, as of today, as of this video, I don't know. So, let, change later. so let me uh, ask you if... Yeah, yeah, no, so, so I wanted to say, mm-hmm. once you are in that trouble, right, where Yes, you are need on the GPU, you need like 1,000. This is the guys who are actually feeling the problem, and this is the guys who are actually causing the problem, and this is the guys who are actually you know, sucking more supply from the market uh, and making there's no available supply at all for everyone. Right? This is the trouble, and here we're focused. But of course, this is also a huge list, right? You have people who need like 20, 30,000 GPUs, like mid-journey and all these big guys. We are not yet ready for these guys as of infrastructure perspective. We will be ready in six to eight months. But now we are focused on anyone okay. less than the journey. You know, like if you're less so let me ask you a follow-up yeah, question. Yeah. Because I'm a data scientist and before transitioning full-time in crypto, I was working as a data scientist in Web2 companies. And so I've worked in um, teams of like uh, AI startups that with a team of data scientists and a team of machine learning engineers doing MLOps and we were using Azure, et cetera. Imagine like IONET becoming big and not having any problem in terms of number of GPUs. The, as I see it, what solution Azure is bringing is not just about the GPUs, but you know, is you have an entire tech department and you want to deploy, you want to do CI, CD, you want to do MLOps, you want to use Kubernetes for all the Docker machines that you have. You want to have control over all, you, have, you want your security, you want your, you know, 
everything that an a production like high tech environment has, you want to answer the sol solutions, right? So, are you going for this market in that sense, or are you focusing? Because as a as far as I know, Ionet is not just addressing the hardware problem. You're also on the software side, with you know the orchestration of all these clusters who are um, in different parts of the world. <laughs> That's a very great question. And I think that comes our roadmap, right? As like, we want definitely, uh, what we learned as you, like if you want to bring, if you want to grow and like, or you want people to stay, you just have to make sure you always grow the services you provide, right? Uh, and you may actually find that you are ending up not making money from GPUs, but from another service that is there, that is with the GPUs, right? So you, you end up discounting the GPU price and then uh, knowing that they can use that other service, et cetera, et cetera. And that's actually already happening in data centers that I know right there. For example, um, they are uh, selling the GPUs, but they're not actually making money from GPUs. They're making money from the storage. Like selling you this volume storage connected to the GPU is actually how they're making money or some other third party apps they have on the platform. Um, and, and, and that's actually uh, like in the long run, yes, we are building more and more features. Um, we want but we want to like be focused on model inference. Like we are the cloud flare of model inference. I want to like repeat that cloud flare of model inference. Cloud flare basically is in the middle of almost eighty mm percent -hmm. yeah. of the website, as you know, in, in the platform. It, it allows this yes, forwarding and CDN, where it's like bring it brings the website geographically closer to the people, so it it loads up very fast. Like Google, it loads up like in a second. How in like a blink of an eye, Google is run with result. Like how. So because they have that, uh, you know, it's very close in to the end user. And we want IO to be the uh, uh, cloud flare of model inference, specifically cloud flare of model inference. So when someone wants to deploy a model, to serve it to the end user, not train a model, to deploy a model. Yes, train a model, that's another service cluster he do, could deploy, yeah, yeah. But our main focus and our main like, go, like product market fit we found is we are we want to be the cloud flare where because we have GPUs now in seventy one countries, and basically we can bring in the model closer geo physically to the end user, and that means faster inference speed uh, and lower latency. So we want to focus on bringing in the, the AI models closer to users because that will help real time AI applications to to live. Like right now we don't actually have, we, there's a problem in the industry right now is but every GPU is almost in the US. So if I have a client in Japan and he wants like live diffusion image generation, like one of the startups we're working with, literally like they need, the requirement was 200 milliseconds. Like I, I move the image, it ha the moment I move the image, it has to like done. It, I have the new image, stable diffusion generated and back. So like a new AI model image in 200 milliseconds. How, how if the GPU is literally physically in, in uh, Boston or in like East Coast, West Coast, whatever it is, like how? It's not possible. Even if you have very fast internet, there's still that latency because of the, uh, but if you have the GPU in Tokyo mm -hmm. uh, or in Kyoto, like that's it, it's done. Like you have the model really fast. And actually that would make it appealing. What already made it appealing for other startups to join us. They were like, yes, you don't have that services like Google Cloud and Azure we have there, but you actually have GPUs everywhere where actually Google Cloud does not have GPUs everywhere. So right now you're solving a big problem for us is we don't, we don't even, we can't even find the GPUs. So give us the GPUs. We will figure out the mm -hmm. other services with someone else, but we really can't find GPUs. Do anything Amazing. to get GPUs from anyone. Right? So I know that it's like, a, it's not, it's not a complete product. We don't have the features like Google Cloud and Azure. Yes. But we have something they don't have. We have GPUs wow. in 71 countries. They have GPUs in like three, four countries now, and they could scale to like, 25 country, 24 country, slowly. It's not easy to scale that fast because you know it's very expensive to keep buying and sending across different countries and so on. But us, 71 countries and grow, right? So that is kind of like, how could you compete with that? Like even AWS cannot compete with that. It's very hard for them to build that fast. I mean, look how it grew fast and still wait for another six months, how many people who are already like buying new chips, building new facilities just to serve AI. So. All that, like crowdsourcing, building this AI compute platform and compute power network is 
is what makes it unique because that okay, that's a pro big guy's true company. problem as a user of uh, azure <laughs> i know that you can actually use continents mostly so you can say i want my you know my stuff to be in Europe or North Europe or America or Asia, but you cannot really go specific. Uh, and also some companies, they have regula regulation, you know, restrictions, like they want to their data and everything to be in a specific country. So I actually think I've heard you even, you want to go to a granularity of cities at some points, which is amazing. Uh, so this is something that others are not offering. Let me ask you a question about the cost. I've seen on your documentation that you're saying that you can, uh, I, through Ionet, people can save up to 90% on compute. Now, comparing the scalability of these big players, how is Ionet able to achieve such drastic uh, drop in costs, compute costs? Yes. Uh, let's notice on the up to, right? So, first, it's like it's gradual. There's sometimes it's 40% save, sometimes it's 60%, sometimes it's 80%, sometimes it's 90%. Now, we have something unique is when the usage on the GPU drops, uh, we drop the prices to push the usage up, like peak time in Uber, right? So in a way. So in that times, it really makes it, it's like almost 95% cheap to, to, to rent the GPUs. Now, um, the other part is these big players, like for example, the RTX 4090. Let's talk about this card. This card is exactly like the RTX, uh, the, uh, the enterprise version of it, the L40. And the difference in price is three times, right? So they're the same one. The, in TFLOP's power for modern inference, RTX 4090 and the L40 is almost the same. But because it's a consumer card, you know, it's, it's, it's for gaming. It wasn't built to, literally for this. It's cheaper. Now, because it's cheaper when I actually bought it, right? It makes sense that it's cheaper here. Uh, to do this, to, to, it, I bought it like for a thousand dollar or two thousand dollar compared to this for eight thousand. So of course it's cheaper because it's cheaper to, to acquire. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is like this into, because it's enterprise, you know, it has this enterprise license fee on, on, on the card the price itself. And that's why it's very expensive and all these like high end cards are expensive. Now, how can we reduce them is basically the problem that's happening is um, the cloud providers, they only want to, when they offer on-demand, they don't want on-demand. On-demand means like you go and rent the GPU and you use for three mm -hmm. hours, you shut it down and you pay for three hours. They don't want that. They want mm -hmm. three years contract, one year contract, because with this contract, you can, they are, they're, you know, they want to pay back the investors who actually bought the physical card. And they want to finish it quickly because the life cycle of NVIDIA generating new cards is every almost nine months or six months. So in nine months, in the last nine months, they released like three, four products. And for that center, like until it's released, until I buy it, until it's in the in, the, in my platform. And then I've, uh, NVIDIA already released a new card, right? So, and now clients come in, they want the new card. I was like, wait a second, I still have... I need to release it for three years until I get back my money for this card, right? So they want this long-term contract. And if it's on demand, they're kind of like trying to like recover for like a week of loss, you know, like a few days of loss. So, so they have that high prices. Um, and the other side on, on compute providers here, they're able to reduce it because first of all, um, they're being paid by something else. Like they are being paid when they're hired and that already looks like uh, uh, like GPU pricing or 50% less in, in, for the enterprise cards. And also you are being paid for your idle time, which even Amazon is not being paid for their idle time, right? Because Amazon is not being paid for their idle time. The GPU supply can't be paid. It's idle and it's just idle. So we're paying people for the idle time for the token reward where uh, that the coin will emit. And on the other side, also, yes, they're getting paid for hired. And also, when they're hired for like three months or four months, like, come on, if, you, if you're M, I don't calculate this for you. If your M3 is hired, it's like $1.5 an hour. Uh, so it's hired for a 30-day contract. That's 20, what, 24. That's $1,000 a month just for your M3 card. Hey, actually, there. you know what? I just recently bought oh. a new Apple MacBook Pro with... Uh, Apple with M3 Max 
and is severely underutilized because I do some training, etc. Sometimes I would, you know, the 40 core GPU and, you know, 128 um, RAM. So it's severely underutilized. Can I, as a, you know, just a single user who I don't have a farm, can I go and... Yes, it takes five minutes. Like, it depends on the internet speed. But, like, you go to the website, you go to work, you go to iWorker, connect new device. There's, Amazing. like, a few commands, just, like, copy, paste, and run it, and install some Docker, and that's it. Like, literally, that's it. Uh, it, it will install mm -hmm. some 20 gigabyte of images. And that image, like, container, containers in your machine. But then after that, like, yes, you're ready. It takes little, if you have fast one gigabyte internet speed, it takes five minutes, you're, you're up and ready. Um, and that's, you know, I think the user experience, we're we are also trying to make even the user experience better and better, but also that would work. And then you can monitor your device, your hiring. And also, the, since you join now, uh, even if you're not hired, you, we're calculating for your points for the airdrop. So anyway, like anyone contributing GPU compute power, the more they contribute, also, it's Interesting. The points for the About the business model uh, for workers, uh, so you know, in the lending, if you go on lending protocols, they provide you an APY to provide to supply, you know, stable coins or whatever. But mm -hmm. this uh, this APY is usually dynamic based on market conditions and you know, uh, etc. As you know. Uh, how does it work on your side? Is it a stable, like, can I think about that if I, like, use, if I provide my GPU and stuff, can I, is it a very stable passive income for me or is it uh, fluctuate based on? I, it, at the current point specifically now, it's literally, it fluctuates a lot, but I think it, it's, it's being stabilizing slowly. Uh, I would expect, like, Whatever your hourly hire rate, like you would expect, uh, uh, sorry, what, what, um, whatever your uh, hiring rate, uh, hourly hiring rate, or whatever you would expect, in average, like you you should be utilized, you know, at least forty percent of the time, at least. And the other forty percent, the other sixty percent of the time, uh, you are, uh, I mean, you are being rewarded for your idle time. Like that's, let's say, hopefully worst case scenario. That's what we're working so hard for. It's not the current stats now, to be like totally transparent, but I think within the next like month and a half, that would be the current status. Um, and, you know, we, because we, we're trying to our best to mm -hmm. like up the bar of really having good GPUs. And because there are like some GPUs, we got them on board, but they really have just 100 megabyte or 150 megabytes of internet speed, which I know is expensive to buy, but how can I act like, how can someone use your GPU if you have like, very bad speed. And someone like that day, a few days ago, complaining and shouting. I was like, "How much is internet speed?" He didn't. Hire, he wasn't hired. He did the open, he open test speed test for four megabyte. I was like, "Yeah." And he was like making a scene, you know, in the chat in Discord. I was like, and then really, so that's why we're like we try we 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 put the bar high. It it it's gonna become like a really exclusive club. You guys as GPU suppliers or provider of compute. Are actually really an exclusive club because you know the bar will also be high in terms of like quality which not anyone could attain and then this itself is a community let's talk about the competition in web 3 we, we talked about competition in web 2 but you mentioned that the market is so big and this is true that there is place for many many uh, actors and actually um, companies working in this and uh, decentralized gpu but because there is a really new trend, I'm seeing almost every week new like projects launching in specifically in this sector, you know, decentralized GPU cloud infrastructure. So there has been Aether, there has been Form AI, there has been Gaming and uh, GPU.net, just to fame, uh, name a few now. Uh, and all of them are doing pretty much the same thing, and uh, which is like cloud infrastructure GPU. Um, we know that this is a big market and we expect to have many players. Uh, do you specifically have any kind of edge or uh, differentiation compared to these ones? Yes, yes, definitely, of course. I mean, yesterday we tested 3,000 GPUs cluster uh, from, I think, more than like 30 something country. Um, and all of this, like literally all these GPUs from like multiple locations either it's a facility or a person, and we clustered all that 
And then at the end, literally there's like a VS code you could click and use that compute power with 3000 GPUs behind it from across the planet. So that clustering technology is built on something that already took six, seven years to build. And then it took me two years to work on and build and test on no latency requirement. And so, and we are already now a team of 71 people working on this. So like, yeah, there is the time that we have actually started in this long time ago and but only we're focused on clusters so if you're if someone is not doing clusters he's not our competitor at all and so far we don't see anyone who's really actually doing clusters again you remember in the beginning we said there's three meanings of clusters the cluster of machines on the same you know uh, like one node or two nodes or whatever but no no we're actually talking about like thousands of nodes, hundreds of nodes at least let's say so yeah uh, clustering is our advantage and um, it's something we're working on. There's so many things we are like bringing in new technology that, that are going to be released on the IO Summit. Can you tell us about your roadmap and what you have ahead for uh, the upcoming two years? Um, that's a lot, but uh, I think we are uh, aiming for the IO Summit, which is going to be released 28th of April or you know around the Bitcoin halving, after the Bitcoin halving. Uh, where we are going to definitely like release our token and the IO Summit will be released and people will see what we've been working on. Um, the IO Summit will repeat every, every. we still didn't decide whether it's every six months or every uh, 12 months. So, uh, and within this like uh, release in this conference, we will release new products. Um, we will release the new technologies, but what I can say is we are focused on um, like becoming 10% of, like our goals as a company, we want to have 10% of the GPUs in the cloud uh, as a, in the network. So if the cloud, all the cloud, other people, uh, all the other cloud providers have like 5 million GPUs, we want to have 500,000 at least. If they have, uh, you know, 10 million GPUs, we want to have 10, uh, 1 million GPU. And also, of course, this number grows, you know, by, so we want to always maintain 10% of the GPUs of the cloud. And we want to be in the every, in, in the mid. Uh, we want IO coin to be between every model inference. Like each time when you ping a model to give you a result, IO coin was in the middle, and that is because there's some compute used or some inference or rarity fee or whatever, like multiple things. So that's what we are focused on. Uh, so yeah, I think IO is going to be one of the most important crypto that's going to be launched this year. I'm very excited for it, and um, yeah, looking forward, looking forward. Let me ask you one last question because we'd like to finish the interviews with a hot take. Uh, we know that a number of even scientists and ML engineers and uh, you know prominent figures have talked about the importance of decentralization for AI because of you know these big companies now look open AI almost controlling everything. What do you think in the long term will be the the intersection of crypto and um, AI, do you think that these will two will eventually uh, converge together? I think, well, they're already like merging in a way or like, you know, uh, touching each other. I think we have the chance to actually shape what should be the decentralized AI, right? Not wait for someone to tell us what should be the decentralized AI. And, and I think that's our opportunity right now. What do you want decentralized AI to be? What we all as a community agree that decentralized AI should be, and we should build it by our hand, and that would become the future, right? So it's like we build the future, we have to shape it with our hands. Uh, and we have, but first to agree on what do you think for the consistency of the crypto market, the growth of, you know, the, the, the motto of uh, everyone has a crypto freedom, uh, unlimited access, you know, permissionless access, that motto. How can we fight for that? What do we need to do to fight for that? While we are still like being definitely around regulation, not going to jail, <laughs> like uh, <laughs> some other people, but like you know, guys from past cycle. Okay, amazing. Thanks a lot, Ahmed, for these insights. It was really interesting and looking forward to see the growth of IONET in the next month and years. Thank you very much. I'm very excited uh, to see it too, man.